how can we make this an expeditious process and, uh, and re- keep the creativity and the, the level of design really high. Business of Architecture, episode 402. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I am speaking to founder and president of Brandon Architects, Chris Brandon. Now, Chris is an architect. He founded Brandon Architects in 2009. Um, They have got a fantastic niche specialism in high-end residential. He works with an incredible array of um, high-caliber clients doing um, really extraordinary homes in California. Uh, And it was very interesting to speak with Chris. Chris is actually one of our business of architecture clients. He's on the Smart Practice program. And in this conversation, we discuss the early days of Chris's practice, how he grew the practice from 2009 in the recession environment, how he weathered that storm, the the tale of bringing on those first employees, how he was kind of doing business development and client acquisition. Um, And then we discuss a lot about some of the delivery, the innovations that Chris has in the delivery of his projects, how he curates the client experience and ensures that they're only involved when they need to be involved and thus making their their own delivery process much more efficient and reducing the amount of of scope creep. And we also discuss some of the leadership evolution that Chris has been going going through, some of the work that we've been doing together on the Smart Practice Program, and of course, Chris's vision for 2022. So this is a really fascinating insight into one of the premier residential practices in Los Angeles uh, region and you know watching the growth of of a up and coming um, practice Um, so sit back relax and enjoy Chris Brandon this podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, Please follow the link in the information. Welcome, Chris, to the Business of Architecture. How are you? I'm good, Ryan. Thank you. Excellent. Good to see you again. As always, as always. I'm very excited to be speaking with you. Um, You are the founder and president of Brandon Architects. You're based in California. You studied in California Polytechnic. That's correct. Yep. San Luis Obispo. Excellent. And you're running a practice that uh, specializes in a lot of high-end hosp- um, high end residential work with the occasional piece of hospitality. Um, and you've been going from 2009. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. Excellent. And you're now a practice of about 20 plus? There's 22 of us right now. Yeah. 22. The potential to become 23 here in a short bit. So. Excellent. Brilliant. Yeah. So quite a, yeah. quite a history. Obviously, you founded the company 2009 when a difficult yes. time for a lot of people. It's basically the worst economic conditions that have, I've ever experienced as an architect. Yeah. Now, was, was that part and parcel of your thinking, I'm going to set up a practice because of that? Or was it you lost a job or what happened? What was? Yeah, the- it was. Yeah, a little bit of both. I mean, I had kind of been thinking about it. I had gotten licensed and uh, I was working for a couple other uh, local architects. Um, but uh, yeah, I basically lost my job. It was, I think, summer of 2009. I had uh, just gotten married, you know, and mm-hmm. I think it was about a month later I got uh, laid off. So it was, there was for rich or poor. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's very interesting. There's a whole there's there's a whole sort of generation of architecture practices that have all been born around 2009 as yeah. a result of the kind of um, recession and redundancies that were made. Yeah, in, I think in, for about a year I still looked for a full time job too. You know, I was kind of making ends meet and doing things on my own, but uh, I was always still kind of thinking that maybe I needed a full time job too. So so you didn't necessarily kind of conceive of the practice as it is now. When you first started, 
No, I mean, I, I kind of hung my own shingle, as they say, you know, and I created my own little website and I was kind of doing some things. I had one, one client and uh, one project that I was officially already kind of doing on my own mm-hmm. uh, on the side. So that, that really helped. But uh, yeah, I was just kind of hitting the streets and doing whatever I could find. I was doing little restaurant remodels and <laughs> additions, things like that. Pretty much anything I could get my hands on. With, with those early projects, how were you going about finding them? What were you, what sorts of activities were you doing to, to generate the work? I kind of tapped into my networks that I had before. So my previous employer, um, he was a really talented designer, but I, I just don't think that, you know, running the business side of uh, the practice was difficult for him. And then, you know, doing Kai and custom homes, I think was better than most parts of, uh, you know, the field of architecture. So people were kind of finishing their homes, but when work wasn't consistently coming in, I think it, uh, you know, there were a lot of cracks that started to show mm-hmm. and uh, it was, it was kind of a, a slow progression. There was sort of paychecks started ending up a little bit late you know, it was kind of became obvious that I was sort of helping to bail out a sinking ship, you know? Yeah. And, uh, um, but yeah, so I, but I had a lot of responsibility where I was before. Um, and so as soon as I officially kind of said, this is, this is not working out, I started reaching out to a lot of contractors, um, you know, designers, people in the industry, just letting them know like, Hey, I'm out on my own. If anything you think could be a good fit, just, uh, you know, give me a call. Uh, which was hard for me because I had never done a sales sort of position yeah. <laughs> where I was before. I, I felt like I kind of absorbed a lot mm-hmm. um, from my previous employer. He was a very good salesman too. Like he, he was one of those guys that could connect, he could connect with somebody within like three minutes, you know, and find some commonality and, and uh, relate it, you know, really quickly. But uh, that was hard for me. It was, uh, kind of getting out of my out of my shell a little bit making some of those calls was kind of tough i I guess the the motivation of keeping yourself fed and the lights on is a is a pretty good one in these situations absolutely yeah it was the ultimate uh you know do or die kind of thing so when when did the business really start to get stabilized would you say And and what did that what did that kind of comfort or stabilization look like for you sure I would say probably in 2011, when I hired my first full-time employee, um, I had uh, started to pick up more work. My wife and I had ended up moving back to Orange County. Uh, we were in uh, the South Bay of uh, Los Angeles at the time in Hermosa Beach. And I was just working out of a spare bedroom that we had. Um, but as I got a little more work and uh, I reached out to old friends uh, as uh, you know, kind of 1099 employees, for a while, yep. uh, which was great. Um, cause everybody at the time was sort of looking for any extra income that could be had, you know? <laughs> um, but when I got to a point where I just really couldn't do it myself, I had, I had a summer intern, uh, which really was, that, that was like kind of an easy commitment to make. Right. Cause it's like, Oh, it's, you know, lower it's pay and it's definitely very temporary. Like he's, he's only gonna be here for three months why not go ahead and do it? And uh, it really opened my eyes as to how much, you know, help I could really get and from somebody who really wasn't even ready, you know, for full-time work. Um, I think he was an exceptional intern. He was great, but uh, that really opened my eyes. So shortly after he left, I hired my first full-time employee. And uh, I always look at that as kind of a big turning point mm. in the whole practice. Um, Cause it was a big commitment. You know, I had been just, you know, trying to feed myself basically for better part of two years and uh, was always worried that, you know, I wasn't going to get the next project wasn't going to go my way or, you know, the the phone would stop ringing. Like the the recession was still not that far in the, uh, in the rearview mirror at that point. So so those first couple of years, then it was pretty much you and your, your wife was involved in the practice as well. Is she an architect? No. No, she was actually supporting us for a long time. So she had a, uh, a really good job with a uh, wine company, a distributor. Right. So that was a, a good recession-proof job. People still drink during the rest. <laughs> <laughs> drink wine, yeah. 
they had a good portfolio, everything from like the, the higher end stuff to the, the low end. So, um, but yeah, she, she worked until, uh, gosh, I think our, our son was born in 2012. So I think she worked right up to that point. She ended up selling insurance and moving back down to Orange County. We both did full time. Um, and then, and then she became involved in the business. She did. Yeah, slowly. So in the beginning, I was kind of doing all the admin stuff, all the billing invoicing. I kind of taught myself QuickBooks and all that stuff. Um, and then, yeah, she does it on kind of a part-time basis. She just kind of saw how difficult it had become for me to do some of that stuff. So she stepped mm. in to help out, which was great. So, so that first employee, um, are they still with you now? Just out of interest. He was, yeah. He just actually left last, uh, last year. So wow, he was amazing. With me for almost exactly 10 years. Amazing. Yeah. That's yeah, cool. it, was, it was a great run. He, he, uh, he ended up going out on his own, uh, up in Idaho. Yeah. Which is, which is great. It was, uh, it was a good party, you know, I'm, I'm proud of him and, uh, I hope he does really well up there. So, so what was the growth trajectory like then from that first employee? How quickly did the business grow? Was it relatively kind of a linear expansion to where you are now, or was there a, a, a certain set of turning points where you kind of, you know, a load of work came in all at once and you were under a, a sort of pressure to hire a bigger team or how, how did it, yeah. how did it That's evolve? That's a good question. I think that honestly, we, we grew in about five or six fairly rapidly. I remember almost about every six months we were, we were hiring, um, which was a little overwhelming, um, mm-hmm. you know, and a little bit scary too, but we just, we had gotten a, uh, a pretty good network um, and we were getting good referrals and, uh, you know, it was, uh, it was an exciting time, but I think it was, it was a little bit scary, but a lot of those original five are still, still with me. Um, ended up hiring, uh, my wife's brother too. So my brother-in-law, uh, when he came out of school in 2012, and, uh, he's now a principal here. Uh, like three of the original guys are, uh, part of my management team now. Mm. So brilliant. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah. And, and who was always involved in business development? Well, the, the, the new employees were part of your team. Did they get involved, actively involved in business development? Or has that always been something that you've kind of leveraged your own network and your own skill set to do? That's a good question. Yeah. Was, for the first 10 years, it was probably mostly me. Uh, you know, I handled a lot of sales calls. I was kind of developing those relationships with different builders, you know, designers, uh, real estate agents, all that good mm-hmm. stuff. Um, but they, they were definitely, I mean, it's such a small practice. And in the first six years, we were in a small little converted warehouse space. And it was, I say it was like asses elbows, you know, <laughs> it was tight quarters and everybody kind of knew what was going on. I mean, you could, there was only like one office, I think, where I could shut the door and have a private. And hear other people's phone calls and what they... <laughs> yeah. So I, I like to think that they just learned a lot through osmosis, you know, um, and I was kind of figuring it out as I went to, I, like I said, my personality was never, um, really that outgoing, mm. you know, I think the, uh, the sales side of the business development side, I recognized that it was really important and I needed to, you know, kind of, I needed to do it. I needed to kind of, you know, you have to kind of eat what you kill kind of a thing. So that having that, so <laughs> that sort of go getter uh, attitude was, was different for me. Um, d- d- does that attitude still exist? Is it something that you, you kind of think is at the core of the business? Or is, and is it something yeah. that the others have kind of tapped into, if you like? Because it's a very, um, this is one of the things that when I speak to lots of architects, this is part, part and parcel of the hardest part of running a practice is, is going yeah. out there and hunting, if you like. Yeah, for sure. I do. I think uh, it's, it's one of my favorite parts of the job. You know, um, you never know what's, uh, the next phone call is going to bring you, uh, the next kind of lead or what, what you're going to catch wind of, but the thrill of the hunt, I think is something that, uh, I've really grown to enjoy. Mm. And, uh, I think I've, I've passed that down, uh, to a core group of people too. So it's just exciting. You know, we really like the people side of what we do and getting to know people that they might have an exciting project or they're just a really great personality or somebody 
you think would be fun to work with. Um, what, what have been some of the kind of strategies that you've employed to, to win work or to, you know, to make sure that you're finding, finding the right caliber of client? Because obviously you're, I know your, your portfolio, you've got some extraordinary houses in, in California and you're clearly working with a, a kind of very high caliber of client that can even afford to buy the plot of land that the house is on, let alone, <laughs> let alone the yeah. building and the design services. How did you penetrate that kind of market? Because for, for many practices, that can be um, like impenetrable. It can be very, very difficult to, to get in. And kind of once you're in, then then you, you know, you, there's a certain caliber of excellence and degree of work that you need to keep bringing to keep, you know. Sure. Um, that's a good question. You know, I, I think in the early days, it was, uh, I was just kind of saying yes to everything. You mm-hmm. know, if, if, it, uh, if it felt like it was, you know, somebody who I could work with and, and it was, you know, any kind of a new exciting project of any caliber, I was just kind of saying yes. But I think as things started to evolve, I definitely started to recognize, um, and I think we all did in the firm, that when we completed a home of a certain caliber uh, in a certain neighborhood uh, or certain locale, um, that it would pay dividends uh, really quickly. Like we would see almost an immediate uptick in you know new inquiries, different uh, different types of clients, different different groups of people would pay attention. Uh, I think a lot of it came from s- uh, the sale of our homes. Um, oh, so wow. we worked with some developer clients early on, and those homes, you know, were basically marketed, and all that marketing was paid for by somebody else, which was kind of nice. And they were, you know, at the time the market was still kind of tough, but these were still pretty high end homes. So they, they were getting exposure. Like I think one of our first press items was like one of the first, that was actually the first home I ever designed on my own went up for sale and it made the front cover of their little local real estate magazine. So that was kind of cool. Were you always um, kind of, you made the decision that we're going to focus solely on high end residential or ha- was part of the business plan to kind of branch out into other sectors or I know you've worked, I know you've done some bits of work in hospitality, um, yeah. but how, how was that kind of a conscious decision to focus on high end resi? Well, you know, I never had a business plan. <laughs> this is something that we'll probably go back and talk about <laughs> later, but uh, yeah, no, I think my passion was really in the custom residential, you know, that's, that's kind of what I've been doing since coming out of school Right, And uh, it just felt like I was learning a lot. Like it was really fun to have people, you know, trusting in you and wanting to spend a a good amount of money, you know, building their personal home and trusting you to kind of make a lot of those decisions and create something really cool. So it was, it was fun to be able to work in a sector of the practice where uh, budgets were less, you know, we we worked with good budgets. So, Mm. um, it seemed like, it, it's, and I still think it's a really exciting field and it kind of puts you at the forefront of, uh, of design. You know, it's, a, it's obviously a smaller scale, what we do, but yeah. the intimacy um, really opens up just a whole myriad of things you can kind of consider, you know? Um, so I think we, I, I always appreciated working at that scale. You know, mm-hmm. you can really kind of get down to really intricate, finite details, um, and touch almost the whole scope of the project too, which is something that we're starting to branch out into more recently, you know, doing uh, landscape design in house and maybe even potentially uh, interior design down the road. So it's just, it was always exciting to me to, to be intimately involved in the whole process and to be able to get down and design it at whatever scale I wanted to, if it's a little doorknob or, yeah. you know, something like that, you could, you could do that. And I think that's that's been kind of passed on to our employees too. But what's the um, the the kind of process that you lead clients through in terms of maintaining a kind of level of excellence with the work, or you know, dealing with those sorts of demanding clients? What? How do you kind of how do you nurture the relationship during the design process? Sure. Um, well, you know, customer service is is. Uh, 
something that we always really recognize is, is critical. You know, at the end of the day, it's the client who's trusting you. They're going through the whole process and you, they really deserve to be taken care of. And, and for us, you know, I like to say that we're really client focused practice and we, we pride ourselves on really getting to know our clients, um, you know, and, and recognizing that it's a big undertaking, a big commitment for them to, to do this house, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, we want them to have fun through the process. You know, we really, we, we like it. We have the most fun when they're emotionally engaged throughout the design. They're excited, you know, they're, they're understanding what's going on. Like it's a big part of my sales pitch. You know, we sure we have a lot of technology, a lot of, you know, renderings that we do in house. There's virtual reality, all, all 3d design. There's a lot of cool bells and whistles that we've got, but at the core of that is really um, the client being able to understand what they're going to get at the end of the day. Uh, and feeling like they're as much a part of the process as they want to be. Right. Uh, which I think is different than some architects. You know, we don't, we don't sort of come to a meeting with a potential new client with some kind of prearranged agenda, you know, or concept. We really like to foster what their, what their passion is, mm-hmm. kind of pull little kernels of inspiration from them and their story and, and really kind of run with that. And. So. Um- can you walk us through the process that you take to onboard a client? So like, what does your sales pitch look like? What does the sales process look like? And how do, how do clients nowadays, how do they find you? <laughs> sure. Uh, that's had to evolve too. Obviously, as, as we've kind of gotten busier, we've gotten bigger and we have kind of a bigger footprint, I guess you could say, in terms of exposure. Uh, so we do get a lot of calls, um, a lot of inquiries, um, I've had to involve a lot of, uh, my staff, um, into the sales team. I kind of have a, a sales team that they're not totally dedicated to sales, but they're, um, they're a really good group and they, I think they enjoy kind of the, uh, marketing and the business development side of what we do. So there's a little bit of a, uh, I guess you call it a filter filtering process that if, if someone's reaching out. You know, they kind of give us their basic information uh, about the project. And if they think it's a good fit, someone will reach out, have a little bit more of an in-depth conversation, uh, just trying to figure out if goals are going to align. You know, like we're, like you said earlier, we're, we're really looking to do um, high-end design, you know, which kind of comes with high-end costs <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> Uh, a, a locale that's got to support, you know, high end um, values at the end of the project too. So these are things we have to kind of get out of the way in the beginning. You know, sometimes they could be kind of uncomfortable, mm-hmm. um, but uh, their their realities about the project uh, and about what we what we bring to a project that we need to make sure somebody is uh, is looking to align with before we continue the conversation too far. Is is most of your work these days um, referral based, or I know that you've got a pretty impressive Instagram platform yeah. <laughs> as well. You've got was it just just yeah. under two hundred thousand followers? I think so yeah, yeah, we're waiting to hit that two hundred k mark. But uh, yeah, that, and that's been great. You know, I think it's I think it's really fun. At any time that we can share our work, um, you know, we we get really excited about it. And Instagram's been a great. Uh, platform for that. It's like great megaphone, cast a wide net, you know. Um, we like to think that our our projects, when they're finished, are our currency, you know. And if you can if you can kind of live in a neighborhood where you where you see it every day or you drive by it and you appreciate it, like that's obviously a great calling card because you can something tangible, you know, you can see it. Um, a website is great because you can kind of curate it and put your finished photos like we we definitely spend a lot of time and energy getting good photography done um, for our projects and, and to be able to show that off um, is a great platform. And then Instagram, you know, it's, it's been huge too, because we can not only show what we've done and kind of get it out there, you know, consistently and quickly yeah. to a lot of different people, but we can also show what we're working on today. And that's, that's another great thing about these renderings that we do in house is that we can in effect kind of show our designs in a finished form before it goes through the whole process, you know, like 
in the old days you had to wait you know a year to finish the design and then maybe two to three years for the house to get built and then you get the photographer and then you have to sit on the photography while you wait for different publishers to try and pick it up right you try and yeah. get some traditional press and so it could be like four maybe five years before your work is actually out there you know um but now i mean we can go to a job site with our smartphones take a picture of the house and put it on instagram you know we can have a rendering that shows what it's going to look like in four years mm -hmm. so we can really show our design stuff that we're working on now um very current versus you know something that we actually designed four years ago in, in its finished form um with say your instagram account um how did you grow it if you like how did you manage to get it to that that scale were you working with outside consultants on it was it partly organic uh yeah that's another great question it was uh kind of trial and error um in the beginning i think we just had an intern a summer intern set it up you know i i was working with uh an old friend of mine who helped me develop the website the logo like a lot of the branding and the marketing materials we had and at the time i think we were using house and uh facebook just a little bit and he said you got to get on instagram like i don't know why you guys don't have instagram <laughs> and i was like well i don't know isn't isn't that just where people take pictures of food and <laughs> <laughs> i was like well, i don't know that's you know so we uh we did that and our our intern who was obviously very savvy set it all up and i think we got really excited when we got to like 2000 followers um you know by the end of the summer or something um, and then I ended up finding a, uh, an outside consultant. So I knew it was never going to be anything that I wanted to do yeah. uh, myself, you know? Um, so we worked on an out outside consultant, kind of developed something that, um, had a rhythm, regular rhythm to it, you know, posting once a day and kind of tracking all the metrics. Mm -hmm. Um, but what really was a big turning point is when my uh, sister-in-law, so, uh, my brother-in-law's wife. Uh, she, uh, reached out to us and said she could really help us out. So she picked it up, really helped us develop a, a voice, um, you know, in a, in a curated, um, sort of platform. So if you look at it now, you can really tell that there's a lot of intention behind what's posted, when it's posted, um, just much more curated kind of content. Yeah, it's, that. it's a really well polished account that looks that is you know everything everything looks great and there's kind of themes and stories that are emerging you can tell that it's had a lot yeah. of thought into it thank you and i'm happy to take zero credit in that you know <laughs> <laughs> i really leaned on people who who understood that platform you know and uh i'll never forget she early on she said to me because i was kind of like you know maybe getting my uh my hands dirty and you know, say, no, we shouldn't say that, or let's talk about this. And she said, well, you can have a really, you know, intelligent conversation with a few people who understand what you're talking about, or you can have a really fun, lighthearted conversation with a lot of different people. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and that's kind of what uh, opened my eyes a little bit. I was like, yeah, this is just, I'm going to trust you that you know what you're doing here. And uh, it was and, good. And, and, and it's quite a significant funnel for new clients, for People, yeah, people find you on Instagram. And especially from outside of our area, you know, right. um, we've done enough work, I think in, in, you know, Newport beach and, uh, coastal orange County where you can see a lot of our homes, you know, or you, you might've seen it up for sale or, mm -hmm. or, you know, just driving around. Um, so I think our, we're, we're pretty well sort of established or saturated in our local markets, but yeah, Instagram has been great. You know, we get, it still boggles my mind sometimes where people all across the world reach out and, uh, you know, inquire as to whether we might be a good fit for their project. Brilliant. What, what yeah. other sorts of marketing activities are you in, involved in, in kind of sharing the word, if you like, or the evangelism that you might do around the practice? Um, yeah, well, the website was a, a good pet project, I think for a good nine maybe 10 years we had something that kind of worked um and we were able to update it but we really wanted something that was more fluid and we could update in real time like we didn't have to 
you know, call somebody and, and wait for them to reprogram something or create a new page or something. So we worked hard finding the right kind of partner. In fact, I think we went to two or three different companies before we landed on the one who could, was actually a good fit for us and could kind of execute what we had in mind. Um, Cause we wanted again, to be able to put our work out there as quick as we wanted to and in, in, in whatever kind of format to package it, how we wanted to mm-hmm. it was important to us. Um, but uh, yeah, we don't, we don't spend a lot of money on, you know, print material. Um, I do have a, a PR firm that helps a lot whenever our projects are uh, completed and we want to um, get into the traditional press yeah. roles. She's great with digital too. You know, so that's an outside firm uh, based in LA that we work with. Um, she, yeah, so she's been really great. Those connections, I also realized after, you know, kind of trial and error, like sometimes you're project is finished and then maybe there's a project team uh there's always a team involved but maybe the project team kind of takes the lead on having the photographer there and where the photos go and it ends up you know in a magazine maybe you're more of a footnote or something uh Mm. (laughs) in a project and so i i kind of learned um early on the value in having um those connections that you can't go make on your own right like i'm not gonna go talk to different publishers of different magazines and you know really try and get my that would just be a lot of energy spent well it, it, it's actually quite i don't know if innovation is the right word but like it takes a little bit of foresight to engage with other consultants particularly marketing consultants like sometimes a lot of architects are are reluctant to 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 do that was yeah. was that engagement something that you just felt was the right thing to do or had you been advised to do that or you or was it kind of the way that it was supporting your ambition if you like uh yeah well i think it was really kind of one project in particular where we felt like we were just really underrepresented you know like it it, it kind of like we were very proud of what happened and it, it just the way it was presented in the press you know the way it was finally packaged and kind of out there really like we felt like we were kind of a footnote you know so it was kind of like then I started thinking like well how did this happen I sort of re I reverse engineered it you know and I I figured out that okay this person had a really great PR team and a lot of this stuff was handled and they didn't really have a have much of a say in it you know themselves sort of and I realized that these relationships were important and I wasn't gonna go and try and create them on my own it's better to just find somebody who's already got them and pay them their worth, you know, uh, to do that. And it's, but yeah, you know, considering a kind of monthly commitment um, that's not insignificant, you know, that Mm -hmm. just doesn't always, it doesn't give you something tangible every month, you know, (laughs) it's like, you can't say like, Hey, I'm going to go get a PR firm and then I'll be on the cover of uh, architectural digest. You know, that's, that's not how it works. (laughs) So, so how how do you measure the kind of return on investment with something like a, a PR firm? Because it's it's an interesting one with many architecture firms, it, and it is it's a seriously significant investment, and it yeah. can be kind of you know how do you gauge the success of it? But we all know that it works. There's the other. It's <laughs> like how but how much is it working? Right. Yeah, I think it's you know it's just another marketing arm that gives you credibility, and it's really something that you, you can't do in-house or, you know, you'd have to be of a really significant size to maybe do that. Mm. Um, but it, uh, it, it can open doors, you know, and, uh, and do a lot for you in the background that you just really don't need to get. It's like, you can equate it to the Instagram, right? Like I've found somebody who's really talented and, and passionate and understands it all and just takes our content and makes it fit for Instagram. It's kind of the same thing, you know, for the traditional press world. Um, and a lot of that stuff's turned to digital too, but they they can see our work, they can pick it up, they can kind of package it and, and promote it how they see fit. And uh, it's, a, it's a good skill set and you don't have to worry about it. Mm-hmm. So I think just knowing that every month our stuff is being looked at and, you know, curated and, and put out there, whether it's picked up or not, you can't control. Yeah. But at least you know that, there's a constant stream of your work going out to these, to these various outlets. Brilliant. Yeah. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the delivery 
tactics, strategies that you have with the work. And I know that you've got a really interesting blackout period when you're oh, doing yes. design. Could you tell us a little bit about what the blackout period is, how you came about it, what does it mean? <laughs> yeah. I think it's, it's definitely something that uh, is always challenging with, with every new client. Um, but yeah, the, the process that we go through, once, once we kind of really get inside our, our client's head, once we feel like we really understand the site, um, and before, you know, when we start putting pen to paper, we try to kind of master plan the project. You know, we really take control of the whole property. Think about the, uh, the floor plan, how it relates to the landscape design. And we kind of, you know, more or less broad strokes, the whole project. Um, once the client feels like that's going in the right direction, um, it doesn't have to be a full sign off. It can just be like maybe 70, 80% or maybe it's a hundred percent, maybe they really love everything. But from that initial kind of sketch or concept, we do kind of go dark. That's uh, what we do is we start building everything up uh, in 3D. You know, we use, we use BIM here, we use Revit. Um, so we take those initial sketches and we basically internally create the whole house. Um, and the end product of that is, is our renderings. So before the clients, you know, see finalized floor plans, uh, we want to show them these renderings, uh, which is really, um, it takes a lot of work, obviously, it takes a lot of time. So that's why yeah. I call it, we, we're going to kind of go dark, you know, for a little while. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I promise that we're, we're working on it. Um, but I tell people like, we have, you know, we have a vision when we're just doing these little sketches, right? As architects, that's, that's our creativity, right? Like that's our, that's our power. We can envision from just a single simple little sketch, kind of the whole finished product. Mm. Um, but our clients can't, you know? And so they, if you could show them a little sketch of the front or a little section or a little side, like that's kind of traditionally what architects do. They might draw the, you know, the front elevation and maybe they put a little color on it or something. Um, and then they'll do the sides and, <laughs> um, but these renderings that we do, they're photorealistic, you know, they're, they're, you know, true perspective. We get to add all the materials we want to add, the color palette, and it comes to life. It's a, uh, I, I like to say it's kind of like an equalizer, you know, mm -hmm. it's when we, when we all look at a finished photo, we can connect with it. You know, you don't have to have a degree in architecture to understand what what's going on. You know, it's, it's a finished photo. So you can decide right away whether you like it or you, or you hate it. Um, and you can have a much more critical dialogue about it because it's, if they don't understand kind of what you're doing, uh, and they don't buy into it, if they're not emotionally connecting with it, then you don't want to do too much work anyway. You know, you don't want to go too far down the, that path. So, so, so you, you, you kind of get the initial sketches or schematics signed off and then that the kind of, you go dark for how long is that period for of dark period if you like uh, yeah depends on the house i'd say anywhere from you know four to eight weeks okay you know, the average is probably like six six to eight maybe a little bit longer if it's a if it's a bigger uh scaled project and is there sort of like zero communication with the client or that they're they're, <laughs> they're they're fully prepared for that and they're uh no we do communicate there's yeah i mean if we're gonna sometimes we'll iterate on the plan a little bit like we might show some options um Sometimes we'll show the 3D model just as a cut through, just to the floor plan to say like, hey, this is kind of the way things are evolving. Are you feeling that this is good? Mm -hmm. um, and we start a really critical dialogue with images too. So we'll send them um, these kind of uh, mood boards, if you will, um, of just different case studies to make sure that we're kind of going the right direction. So like you're, you're teasing them. Yeah, we're teasing them. It's exactly. a tease. You know? I love it. <laughs> We never show our hand until it's uh, totally done, which is, to be honest with you, it's one of the hardest parts of the uh, the practice as it's evolved. Um, it's always been our, our uh, and we're constantly tweaking it, you know, how we can make the process better, how we can better communicate with the clients, but also internally, you know, how can we, how can we make this um, an expeditious, you know, 
process mm-hmm. and uh, and re- keep the creativity and the, the level of design really high. It's 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 constant it's constant balance. Did, did you have uh, some situations in the past then where you were kind of let's say overly involving the client in the design process and then it was kind of slowing you down? I think so. Yeah, and it and it kind of had to do with the type of architecture that we were doing. Um, Obviously, the sophistication level of a client too. Like, if you're working with a developer or somebody, um, they can probably read those plans. Like, it's not their first rodeo. You know, they can understand the working drawings, and they don't, they might not need all the extra bells and whistles. Um, but uh, yeah, it, 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 sometimes the contemporary stuff is really challenging. Like traditionally, back in the day, we would uh, do a little colored sketch of the front elevation and. You know, I, I definitely remember one client coming back and saying, gosh, this, I think it's cool, but like, why are all the windows blue? You know, <laughs> I had to explain to them, well, they're not blue. It's just the reflection of the sky. You know, it's just the, <laughs> we, put the, <laughs> we put the blue pen on there to show that it's a window, you know? So it's like, you know, they just struggled. Like I knew it was a really cool design because we could see it. Mm-hmm. Um, but like the, the little drawing I was giving them, it just wasn't, you know, they weren't walking away feeling, wow, this is cool. You know, they just, it's kind of falling flat. So. Yeah. That, that, I think it's really interesting to kind of really curate the the reveal, if you like. And I, I yes. like the fact that you've kind of, you brought it more and more inwards and you're like, no, you can have these little teasers right now. Cause it's, it's also demonstrating a lot of leadership and, you know, kind of putting the ball in your court of like, we're the experts. You're going to have to trust us on this. This is where we're going. <laughs> yes. Rather, rather yeah. than sometimes, I, and again, it's going to be very different from practice to practice, but the, the kind of having the client involved in every ebb and turn of the design process can be a little bit overwhelming for them. Right. And as, and as you say, they don't fully understand this is a sketch. This is a, this is a drawing or there's a kind right. of architectural intention behind something graphical and perhaps that drawing hasn't quite captured it but there's the essence of it yet but then the client is reading it very literally and they're like no no no, we don't want we don't want that in our house yeah yeah exactly and that's why i think those those images you know right away they can connect with it emotionally and it's one of my favorite parts of the process they're they're really fun meetings to do you know we almost do like a little drum roll in the you know conference room (laughs) And I've had uh, lots of clients react emotionally, you know, that wow. sometimes they get a little bit teary. They're, they're so, you know, over the moon about it. And uh, sometimes they don't, they don't, don't even understand that it's not a rendering. You know, they think it's, I'm showing them somebody else's house that this is going to look like, <laughs> <laughs> like I'm showing them another case study, you know. It, you have this little virtual reality as well, right? The kind of views and things. Yeah. So, and that's the, really the next big step. Um, and that was an evolution as well. So we've always been 3D based, you know, we've always kind of been using BIM. And uh, when we started doing these renderings for the exterior design, um, they were great. And they were getting us the chance to get sign off. Like, sure, it's a big risk, right? Like we put a lot of time and energy and, and cost into getting to those renderings. Um, but if you can't get the design approved, at, at some point you're wasting your time and energy anyway right like if you can't move the project forward then you can't invoice and so it was it was helping us um get over some of those barriers uh of the schematic design phase but when we start going to the interior we were having some of the same uh problems so we used a lot of different tools um lumion i think you've probably heard of uh yep. there's enscape which we do, we still continue to use or something called fusor was around for a while twin motion like we we were trying to find the right balance of uh programs to show the injury of the home and kind of give clients a walkthrough we thought this is this is gonna be really great because now we've shown the outside but let's let's show them the inside and kind of they can understand how it all fits together and um but there's just always these um kind of shortcomings anytime you take a 3D object and you project it on a 2D platform, you get kind of, it, it gets skewed, right? Yeah. Uh, and that's really, um, when you go inside a home, it's, it's uh, magnified. So we would be doing these tours and, you know, sometimes we put people in there for scale that, you know, the clients would say like, oh gosh, the ceilings look like they're really low or, 
you know, is this, is this as big as the house is going to be? Like, this place seems really small, you know, this feels tight. <laughs> we're trying to tell them, like, no, this, the ceilings are really 12 feet tall, you know, it's just, it's the program. We were constantly... The, 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 the person uh, is scaled down to, like, mouse size. And the whole... yeah. yeah, we were constantly, um, you know, making excuses for the software, you know. Mm. And, and trying to say like, oh, this is, this is not reality. You know, like this is in, in reality, it's going to feel a lot bigger. You know, this is just, this is just what the computer can show us now, you know? Yeah. Um, but when we started, uh, I think we bought one of the first Oculuses that came out, uh, the beta version or whatever. That was, I don't even know, six, seven years ago. Uh, it was a big game changer because we could, we could tell right away that, that sense of scale that you that you can't get in any other kind of medium uh, is critical. Mm. You know? So now, now we do the same thing on the interior. So in our design development stage, we look back on the inside of the house. We really develop all the ceilings, um, try and nail down a lot of the interior design components, and uh, we get we get kind of buy off on directions of that as well. Like we usually get mood boards or. Um, some little drawings or snippets from our designers uh, or clients Mm. and our uh, 3d artists, they run with that and they kind of create the whole house in a realistic setting. So they're putting furniture, you know, art on the walls, lighting. um, Because again, if it's not, uh, if they can't connect it, they can't understand uh, what it's actually going to feel like. um, Then they can't get attached to it. You know, they can't buy off on it. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's, it's a basically a three dimensional rendering, um, that they can see and feel, you know, the, the scale is really what's the coolest part about it. Like you can feel how tall the ceilings are and how big the room is. And, you know, have you found that this process has prevented a lot of unnecessary client changes? I'm yes. Thinking. And that, and that is critical too, because obviously you know, traditionally, the first time a client can visualize the house is when it's being framed, you know, like be- before the Oculus and all this uh, cool technology. It was only <laughs> when it was on site. Before. Oh, that's how big the bathroom is. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, before before all this cool stuff, before the, the metaverse or whatever, um, they, uh, you know, when the house is being framed, they'll walk out there and, you know, that's not when you want to be making changes. I I used to joke and call them uh, Saturday morning phone calls, you know, because um, like I said, when the house is being framed, that's when the clients, and, and when do they go walk it for the first time? You know, it's usually on Saturday morning <laughs> when they don't have work. Uh, you, know, you know, they'll call you and be like, uh, you know, Chris, I don't understand why the ceiling's so low up here. Like, you know, then you have to have those awkward conversations. It's like, well, there's, you know, there's a roof deck up there and, you know, it's, it was always in the plans that way. I thought you needed mm. that, you know? Um, yeah. So it's just stuff like that. You want to avoid, like we want them to be happy all the way through the process. Like that's our big, um, that's our big hairy goal, I guess, with every project. And that obviously when the house is, you know, taking shape, they should just be over the moon. And so, 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 so when you um, say you're issuing contracts documents, do you show the clients those drawings? Do you walk them through them, or do you actually find that it's actually it's not it's not necessary for them to to see those drawings? They need to experience the building. Here's they can look at the three D models. That's what we want to. That's what we want them to have and enjoy, and they don't need to know about all the back end. Yeah, yeah, in a big part, you know, it's definitely not really part of my sales pitch. Um, I do I do say that we you know we pride ourselves on doing really good construction documents and. Mm-hmm. And uh, BIM is a big part of that, you know, um, and that's and that's critical because I also tell my staff, it doesn't matter how great these renderings are, how cool the VR is, if it doesn't end up in this roll of drawings, uh, then it's not it's not going to exist. And it's not yeah. the way it's going to come out, you know. So there's there's a lot of effort, a lot of work that goes in there, but the clients could could care less, you yeah. know, about that. And and I tell them that too. I say, you know, you could you could hire a firm that would do things more traditionally um, and they could have a whole team of drafters, you know, drawing the details, developing the the door window package and all these man hours into this process. Um, But what's really important at the end of the day to you is the design. Mm. Um, 
you know, and obviously you want it to be executed, but that's, you know, that's, that's what's important to them. That's what they want to see. So yeah, by the time the VR is, is done and they've walked through it, um, we kind of have their buy off and, and we're just going through and, and doing the construction documents and really trying to make sure that it all fits together and works. Fascinating. I, I, yeah. I, it's really interesting the way that you're curating this kind of client journey through the, the process and being very selective over what they get involved in and what they don't get involved in. It's, yeah. it's, it's smart. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what happens when you're delivering work in the contract administration phase? Are you guys heavily involved in that, in that stage? I remember you saying to me once that at, actually it's a stage that you don't necessarily charge for. And this is a, a conversation that not that you don't charge for it, but you don't, you don't, you, you make up for it in other parts of the process. So there isn't like an hourly billing that you, have I got that yes. right? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. So that we do like to stay really involved in our projects all the way through. Um, and I'll tell folks that too, we're not in the business of just doing a design and kind of handing it off to a contractor and saying, good luck. You know, we, we get emotionally attached to these things too. We want to make sure that they're executed well. Um, and so there's certain milestones where we definitely want to be involved mm -hmm. uh, and approve, you know, material palettes, look at samples, mock-ups, all these kind of things. We want to be able to troubleshoot and, and help the contractor through that process. But yeah, the, the billing part of that has always um, been kind of interesting. And I, and I think of practices where I was uh, before, I saw a lot of shortcomings um, in the, in the hourly kind of, uh, format, which I, I think is probably most typical for custom residential. Um, but you know, it can, it can lead to awkward conversations. Um, like, you know, if you're out there, let's say you're, you're troubleshooting because no set of drawings is perfect, right? Like nothing, nothing's always perfect. And you got to go out to the job site and solve a problem, you know, and you spend that time doing that. Maybe you work with the contractor, maybe you involve the client uh, or not, but then and then you come back, everything's hunky dory until you send them that bill, you know, for the for the four hours or whatever it was. Yeah. <laughs> and then they're like, "Well, was it should have been in the drawings before? Like, why did you have to go there? <laughs> did the contractor screw something up? You know, was it your fault? Was it was it the engineer? Like, you know, it just it goes down this rabbit hole. And so the fixed fee, we basically allocate a percentage of our fee to every project for the construction administration. And I think we make it a smaller percentage than most do also, mm. because um, a lot of times the changes are very minimal, you know, things that are happening like that, that goes back to getting the client really understanding what they're getting into, you know, so that during the construction process, they're not, they're not making changes. They're not kind of, um, you know, getting their hands dirty, so to speak. So we're not, we're not as, as involved in uh, handling deltas and changes and stuff. And then just spending more time on the construction documents. And I, I really credit a lot of that to BIM too, is that, you know, once you've got a really well-developed 3D model and you document it tightly, um, yeah. there's fewer things that can go wrong. You know, it's, it's usually a lot of, uh, uh, typical course of construction stuff you might just have to kind of watch out for, but mm -hmm. there's no more big scary moments. Um, there's one one uh, little anecdote or little story I like to tell even potential new clients. Um, so we had this big beautiful house in uh, uh, in New Hampshire on Lake Winnipesaukee, and it's it's uh, maybe sixty or seventy percent done right now for these really wonderful clients. Um, and in the design process, we always had this master suite that had is a really big room and had this uh beautiful two-sided fireplace in between where the bed was and the retreat and it kind of existed that way in the design for a long time the interior designer loved it clients loved it we loved it and then when we when we shipped them the vr um and they did that they came back to us they said gosh you know we just don't love this fireplace it doesn't feel right let's let's push it to the end of the room you know let's just make it one big room and I think like, gosh, that, that right there, you know, it was an easy change, a little yeah. bit of doings with the structural engineer, you know, but like nothing had started construction yet uh, or even been permitted. And I think, God, that, that would have been such a painful conversation during construction, you know, 
when they're walking in that bedroom for the first time and they see this <laughs> big fireplace that Wait, they don't hold on a minute. Like, you know. <laughs> It's 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 really fascinating because it kind of demonstrates as well how much you're in tune with your clients, if you like, um, yeah. and and we kind of take it for granted that that clients can read architectural drawings and they understand all the information that's being presented to them, and they really don't, particularly right. in the residential sector. This is, you know, they they might be nodding and saying yes, I understand it, but they don't necessarily. We we forget that it's taken us as architects a long time to develop that skill to visualize. What, yeah. the, what the drawing is actually actually saying yeah and i can and I think that's I'll, I'll tell people that too like i ask them one of the first questions i ask them is have you ever worked with an architect before you know have you ever remodeled or built a home and if they say no i say well you, you come to the right place you know it's uh and i think a lot of times we try to have a great experience obviously with all of our clients but i think sometimes the ones who've never done it before maybe enjoy the process the most mm. um because it's uh, it's sort of like uh, I don't know, un, un demystifying the, yeah. the whole process. I guess it, it's just giving it to them in a format that they can understand. And I think yeah, they really appreciate that digestible and understandable. Yeah, because I think they go in thinking, "God, I'm gonna I have to spend a lot of money, you know, and I and I want the design to be right." Mm. But I, you know, I think they're maybe they're worried about uh, making the wrong decision or you know, like you said, not being able to read the drawings and then having remorse over making one decision versus the other or something. Yeah. yeah. Brilliant. Um, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the structure of the office and how that has kind of changed over the, over the years. And, and obviously you're, you're one of our smart practice members and we've been working together now for what nearly best part of a year. I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. And, and, it's, year. and it's been really interesting yep you know, cause you, you, you came to us with a thriving business that was, you know, <laughs> doing, doing fantastic things. What, what sorts of things have you been doing internally or, or leadership wise or like kind of structuring sure. the business? Cause that's obviously you're going through this interesting process now where the business has gone from the kind of small size and is now entering into that medium size firm. Right. And there's a lot of different things that start to happen management wise. Absolutely. Yeah. And it, and it takes on a life of its own, right? It's, I yeah. feel like it's got its own momentum. It's got its own life. Uh, and it's not just me anymore. Um, so, yeah, I, I honestly have really enjoyed learning a lot of uh, a lot about business, you know, with a capital B uh, over the last year, because I obviously got no education in that in, in mm. school, you know. Um, and a lot of it I was kind of intuiting and sort of figuring out for the, those first 10 or 11 years. Um but I've, I've really enjoyed the reason I kind of reached out is because I was getting to the point where I, I knew that I couldn't do all this stuff on my own and mm -hmm. I was needing to find the next, um, you know, generation of, of leaders, um, in the, in the company and really, you know, figuring out what that structure was going to look like, um, what kind of responsibilities I needed to kind of, you know, develop more, like I said, Earlier, when I realized I, I needed to get good at business development because I had to literally survive, you know, <laughs> and, find, and find work, um, but I, I did it. And I think after employee number five or six, I realized that I I couldn't manage any, any I couldn't directly manage any more than that. Mm. You know? um, and I and I understood that the next wave of growth was coming from those people and their management of other good, talented people. And that, that kind of, I guess, season of growth sort of made sense to me, but I could still kind of have an eye on everything, right? Like I could still kind of have my hands in every single project. I could, you know, deal directly with every single client and still do all this administrative stuff. Yeah. Um, and it was a lot to juggle. And then when we got to about 18 or 17 or 18, I just felt like I was kind of drowning, you know, I felt like I didn't have enough time to really curate these designs, you know, handle the business side of what I needed to do, set budgets and, you know, come up with 12 week plans, all this kind of stuff. I had no, I know concept of that, but I knew that there was something, um, 
that I needed to do for this next generation. And I didn't want to give them a platform that wasn't solid. Yeah. You know, so I think I was kind of fine sort of figuring out, obviously, like you said, we were successful, you know, we were in the, in the black and uh, there was no like big warning signs or anything going off. Um, but I really just wanted to make sure that I was taking the right steps with the, with the next period of growth that I just didn't understand. You know, I yeah. felt like the other, the other steps I could, um, but this one I knew I, I couldn't, couldn't do it on my own. What, what sorts of things have you been putting in place with the, your, the leadership team? How have you been kind of cultivating, cultivating them and, and what does your role look like nowadays? <laughs> yeah. So I think uh, about a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago, I started elevating um, some of those original uh, folks. Um, I created a junior principal. He's now a full principal. Uh, I created an operations manager. Um, and then uh, my wife uh, retired. <laughs> she, she found an exit strategy uh, probably later than she wanted to. But, uh, <laughs> Wise lady. <laughs> I, I know. It became a lot, you know, just the invoicing and like some of the easy stuff is just it became a lot every week. And yeah. uh, um, so we hired a controller, uh, which has been great. So I kind of put into place um, other uh, really talented people who could take off some of the administrative stuff that I needed to do to kind of run the business. So I could focus more on the design and the curation. And, and so I like to say today that I'm more of a curative director than I am a president or CEO or, anything like that. Cause I think that's, that's really where my uh, passion is. Mm. And, and that's really where I've kind of focus. Um, so yeah, that's, that's been, uh, that's been a lot of fun. And then, you know, learning some of the basic things I, I probably needed to have instead of inside of a business, you know, like, you know, core values and a mission statement and how to run a meeting and all that stuff has been, been very cool. And I've seen the trickle down effects uh, with, with my management team and, and with the, the whole team as a, as an aggregate too. It's been cool. Amazing. What's next yeah. for the rest of 2022? <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, you know, these growth and markets outside of our area have been really interesting and fun. Um, so I think we're, uh, we're going to continue to kind of pursue that. We, uh, we are willing to grow some more too. And we're, th we're thinking about taking on different product types. So one of the most fun projects we had the chance to do um, a couple of years ago was this uh, hotel in Dana Point, the Strand Hotel. It was our first boutique hotel. Uh, it was a really great opportunity. And we kind of threw the whole uh, office into it. Like I think we almost shut the whole office down for 30 days and we all kind of threw our creative energy into this project and, and came out of it with a really cool design, some great renderings. And uh, it was really well received. You know, the client loved it. Um, a lot of people in this industry that we had never historically had any uh, ties to or relationship to um, got a hold of it. And we got a lot of great kudos. We won a couple of awards mm. um, for just the, the conceptual design. Was, and, it, was, it, and it, was it an invited competition? Sorry. Um, no, it wasn't. We, uh, it, we just caught wind of it through one of our developer clients and had the opportunity to kind of, to win at least the, the design contract. You right. know, we, we understood that we weren't a big enough firm to execute, uh, a hotel, you know, right out of the gate. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, it was, it was, it was fun. We kind of treated it like a contest, you know, <laughs> it's like, okay, we, we're given this chance and maybe the fee that we charged at the time was not even enough to cover our costs. Um, but, you know, it was kind of like a, a Hail Mary, I guess you could say. But it was, <laughs> we, learned, uh, we learned a lot. And uh, I think we saw that it was a success. So it really opened our eyes um, in our thinking that like, hey, maybe, you know, what we do translates to other product types. You know, like, and I think a high-end hotel is a good correlation like you could say that a lot of times people come into a destination like that they want to kind of have a custom home uh feel to it you know it's, yeah it's, it's it's, of, it certainly seems like a very natural extension of what you've already developed a, a skill set in yeah to, to move into exactly so 
that's Brilliant. that's a that's an area that we'd like to uh, potentially find some more work in and uh, market for. Excellent. I love it. I think that's the perfect place for us to conclude the conversation, Chris. Thank you very much for giving us that deep dive into your, your practice and, <laughs> and showing us how it's evolved and grown. And you got it, right? yeah, really, really um, interesting and very valuable conversation. So thank you very much. You got it. Thank you. Glad to be a part of it. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. If you enjoyed today's show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. I read every single one. Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment, and financial success by going to smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.